Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Harwood. I'm president of the New York chapter of SVU, the Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and I'm very happy to welcome you to our program this afternoon. Uh, we'd like to thank, as always, the Bohemian Benevolent and Literary Association, our principal sponsor, which makes all of our programming possible. Uh, we're also uh, thankful to the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which has awarded us grants to help uh, get our programming uh, on YouTube. And so we encourage you to uh, check us out on YouTube, see our past programming there, and to subscribe to our channel. Um, I'd also like to make a pitch uh, for our next program, which is coming up next weekend. Uh, this is actually sort of the second in a two-part program we've uh, had dealing with aspects of uh, uh, Czechoslovak uh, sporting activities and politics in the 20th century. Today's program is uh, here designed to help us all understand better what is going on in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, as we are trying to do that, we would encourage you uh, all, I'm sure many of you have already uh, made contributions to help Ukraine, to help the people there. And so there are many options, but we recommend these two uh, Czech NGOs, both of which we think do excellent work, uh, in part because they have very good connections with, with people in Ukraine, with organizations within Ukraine. Uh, and so it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our speaker today, Igor Lukash, who is our good friend uh, and has uh, uh, contributed talks for us before, uh, and who I think is probably one of the best people uh, we could come up with to, to help us understand this very complicated and troubling situation that we have uh, in the world today. Uh, Igor Lukash is professor of history and international relations at Boston University. Uh, most of his research uh, uh, concerns uh, international relations in Central and Eastern Europe in the 20th and 21st centuries. His publications include the book uh, On the Edge of the Cold War, American Diplomats and Spies in Post-War Prague, which came out with Oxford in 2012, uh, for which he was awarded the Central Intelligence Agency Award uh, for outstanding contribution to the literature on intelligence. Uh, he's also the author of Czechoslovakia Between Stalin and Hitler, the Diplomacy of Edvard Benesch in the 1930s, uh, and also the co-author and co-editor of many other studies. He's the recipient of um, numerous fellowships. He's been a fellow with the Hoover Institution uh, and the Woodrow Wilson Center and has received additional fellowships from Fulbright, uh, Fulbright Hayes, IREX, uh, the National Endowment for Human Humanities, and others. Uh, and so it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome today's speaker, uh, Professor Igor Lukacs. Take it, Igor. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Susanna. Obviously, this is a complex and most importantly, painful topic to discuss. And I'm really grateful that you've taken time on Saturday afternoon to uh, talk about these difficult issues. I want to um, spend a brief moment um, talking about the subtitle of my presentation, Putin's yearning for empire. Um, I think you can probably sense that I am sort of indirectly debating a popular theme uh, that you can find expressed repeatedly in popular media, that Putin is in the business of seeking to rebuild the Soviet Union. I don't think he is. I think, um, uh, he and people around him have a remarkably sophisticated understanding of the Soviet Union and its weaknesses. I think they um, have very little respect for their predecessors, people like Brezhnev and Khrushchev and specifically Lenin. And um, I think that um, on the other hand, they really long for the great days when um, Tsar Alexander um, defeated Napoleon and um, his Cossacks uh, could um, water their horses in Paris. And I think that if there is a longing for some kind of an old model, it isn't communism, which I think has been discredited not only in our eyes, but also in the eyes of the present Kremlin leadership, uh, I think that if there is any kind of yearning, it is for the czarist past. 
So um, the next topic I want to bring up is that uh, whenever in the past, certainly throughout the 20th century, the West encountered some problem in uh, East Central Europe, it sought to contain it, it sought to isolate it. Uh, Munich, of course, is a very good example of that kind of a um, um, of that kind of attempt to to pretend that a crisis uh, can be kept uh, can be kept from our own borders. Um, uh, Budapest fifty six, uh, Prague sixty eight, uh, the Polish crisis throughout the nineteen eighties are other examples where the West simply wanted to contain and isolate. In the 21st century, and this is a point I want to sort of make as prominently as I can, uh, it seems that the emergence of something called the cyberspace makes it essentially no longer possible to rely on containment we now practice something called defend forward, uh, which is a much more proactive attempt to anticipate crises as they threaten to develop and hopefully to somehow blunt their edges. This I think is a recognition of the fact that in the 21st century, um, the old concept um, sovereignty, which of course was introduced as the one of the great pillars of international stability at the treaties with the treaties of Westphalia in 1648, that concept is no longer really plausible because as I say in the uh, description here, there are no international waters in space. And I mean, not just in, in space, space uh, way above our heads, but also um, anywhere else. Um, the third topic I want to uh, dwell on is that um, Putin, I think, um, like many of his predecessors among the dictatorial class, I think that he um, had misread uh, the West. I think that uh, he had convinced himself that the West um, is kind of a feat that it is. It's it's so wrapped up in in debates um, um, about how many types of bathrooms there should be in every airport uh, that they would simply respond to his aggression against Ukraine uh, by. Um, imposing a few more sanctions and protesting in the um, Security Council, which he would veto and the world would simply um, move on. Instead, the world no longer governed by containment um, um, applied the defend forward approach to uh, the uh, evolving crisis and it mobilized and um, I think fairly successfully helped to defeat the, um, the Russian armed forces, um, certainly for the moment. Which leads me to another important point that um, in the past, whether it was fighting uh, against Napoleon and obviously before Napoleon, Swedes, Poles, um, um, obviously Hitler too, um, courage and patriotism and blind obedience, uh, willingness to sacrifice your life. These were the, the virtues that every soldier was required to display. But again, in the 21st century, in the great cyberspace, uh, these values are perhaps marginally useful, but what I think is at least as useful is planning and logistics and, uh, well, uh, being able to communicate. Uh, people 
in fact, explain that um, so many Russian generals have already uh, died in combat, have been killed in action, primarily because the Soviet, the Russian military communications simply don't work. And so they have to come up front uh, to the very tip of the advancing column where the Ukrainian sharpshooters are waiting for them. So um, I think this just again shows how Russia went into this uh, conflict uh, grotesquely underestimating what it takes to fight a successful campaign in the 21st century. It is simply really, really different uh, from, uh, from what it took in Budapest uh, 56 or Prague 68. So here I want to um, introduce a man that um, uh, who is not really well known, but he, he really should be. He is a, a playwright by profession. He is a kind of a um, one of the Moscow intellectuals, uh, Vladimir Sorkov. But he is not only a playwright and a kind of a coffee house intellectual, he's also a great connoisseur of power. In fact, many people say that he is the one who designed that whole political system that has Putin at the very top. Uh, people call it Sistema. And um, he is the, the one who um, um, organized this uh, great mass movement called Nashi, where uh, Russian teenagers are all dedicated, devoted personally to Vladimir Putin. Their, their pop music songs, Takomo Kak Putin, you know, if only I had a boyfriend like Putin and so on. So uh, Surkov is a very clever man. Now, this same Surkov, I discovered um, belatedly only nine days before the invasion of Ukraine, published a uh, memorandum that really um, made me very concerned about the future. It's called The End of Shameful Peace. And I'm sure many of you would immediately realize that this is a not so subtle reference to the, the um, expression that was very popular in interwar Germany, Germany between World War I and Germany. Oh, for fuck's sake, what is a fucking problem? And uh, World War II, um, when Hitler loved to complain about shameful Versailles. So um, Surkov in this memorandum uh, mentions these uh, three points that I will let you read on your own. I think they demonstrate, um, first of all, that they're all wedded to the old concept of controlling land, which I think is obsolete and is a sort of a hopelessly 19th, 20th century uh, concept that is alien to the 21st century. Then I think it demonstrates that uh, they um, have no regard for Lenin and Bolsheviks. Uh, they consider them cowards, in fact. And then they um, make uh, lots of threats about um, um, that the West must not expect uh, obedience and silence from Russia. What, he's, uh, what he calls lots of geo geopolitics ahead, I think is uh, uh, a clear reference to uh, further um, conflicts. So if I had to... Um, sum up what uh, Surkov and people like Surkov uh, believe Russia requires, it is in these three points. And again, um, it's, you know, the clock is merciless. So um, every one of these points would require a deep conversation. But I think that you can understand on yourself, on, on your own here, that um, again, it, it's all reference to Russia controlling vast chunks of territory, which if you ask anybody in Switzerland or Luxembourg or um, Austria, any one of these rich European countries, they're not concerned about grabbing other people's territory. They're concerned about 
making um, communications between banks and markets more efficient. That's how you succeed in the 21st century, not by grabbing territory. Um, your dignity should not be anchored in your ability to grab other people's territory. And um, in fact, being feared is, um, again, um, I think it's just a step in the wrong direction. Um, if I had to identify somebody who is now very popular in the Kremlin, it is Mr. Mackinder, uh, the great and highly regarded in his day author of um, a, a very popular, very influential article that he published before World War I, and then a book that came out um, after World War I, in which he argued that um, there is a chunk in Eurasia, which roughly corresponds with today's Ukraine. Obviously, this is Crimea, if you need uh, to orient yourself here. And he claimed that whoever controlled that part of Eurasia would control Eurasia and would ultimately be the dominant force in the 21st century. Now, there were two people who really listened very closely to this message, and I'm not comparing them, but um, it's simply true that there were two people who listened very carefully. One was Adolf Hitler, who writes about the need to control Ukraine repeatedly in Mein Kampf. It's really one of the few relatively rational moments that you can find uh, in Mein Kampf. And the other one, of course, was Joseph Stalin. Um, the two clashed um, over, over the control of Ukraine um, with tremendous fury. And as you can see, according to um, current research, about 17 million Ukrainians died uh, because the forces of East and West clashed um, over the control of that land. You've heard it uh, many times before that Putin launched his war on Ukraine uh, first and foremost by weaponizing history, right? So right from the start, when he was still a very close friend of George W., he kept telling him that Ukraine was not a real country, that it had no right to exist. And he said it so often, and he said it with so much conviction that um, many others then started repeating it, as you can see here, a quotation from Mr. Trump, who essentially uh, quoted um, Putin's ideas verbatim. Another person who um, fully embraced uh, this sort of a uh, line of argument is a, another puppet of Mr. Putin. Um, and this is the um, previous Czech president whose name is Václav Klaus. I will uh, give you a few seconds to read this paragraph on your own. So the reason why I have this quotation here at all is that uh, when it comes to George W. Bush or, um, or Mr. Trump, uh, we can sort of imagine that they probably don't know much about history. And why should they? They were presidents of the United States, not, not presidents of Ukraine or Eastern Europe. So it, it certainly is not necessarily their failing. But uh, somebody like Klaus, I think, is not ignorant. And uh, therefore, he must understand the falsehood of what he is saying. And um, what is even more painful to me, that he should understand that what he's saying here is essentially a quotation from an infamous speech by um, Hermann Göring in September 1938. It, it is truly, virtually verbatim. Let me give you the Goering version. 
Czechoslovakia has no tradition of statehood. In two decades, it failed to create a state its citizens would be willing to accept. Think Sudeten Germans, think Hungarians, think Poles and others. It didn't emerge because its citizens sought self-determination and sovereignty, but only because of the dissolution of the Habsburg Empire. So when it comes to history, if you really want to go way, way, way back and consult somebody who is a current archeologist or anthropologist, they will tell you that the previous consensus was that civilization began some, that, that the first, what they call mega cities, that is cities that had tens of thousands of people, that mega cities existed primarily in Iraq, Iran, and Syria. And it now turns out that there is a uh, relatively recent discovery in a place called Nebelivka, where a um, um, location was found, which is now believed to be the, the, the site of probably the oldest mega city on this planet. But then we have to jump over millennia to get somewhere to the seventh or eighth centuries and note, please, these huge rivers which really made Ukrainian history, especially Dnieper. These great rivers were invitations for Swedish Vikings who traveled on these shallow boats who were, that were really um, river going boats. And uh, their objective was to come from Scandinavia, mostly with furs, and make it all the way to Constantinople to do business with goods and also, sadly enough, in slaves. In fact, the very word Rus with Miako and Naznachenie, Rus or Ruotse, is related not to any Slavic word, but rather to an old Norse word for either Swede or rowing. So here you see. Um, and this is just a sort of a comment on the notion that Ukraine has no genuine history. Here you see these trading routes that were, that were maintained, that were created, opened, and created by the Swedes. It was the Vikings who, uh, in fact, even brought Christianity uh, to uh, what we now consider Ukraine. Um, uh, Valdemars or Volodymyrs or Vladimir's um, wife was a Byzantine princess. Most likely she was a Christian, and it was thanks to her that he accepted Christianity in 988. The next player um, is not just Genghis Khan, but lots of his sons and grandsons. They came to the area repeatedly, they were always victorious. They fought two truly significant battles, one in what is today's Poland, another one uh, in, in today's Hungary, and they were always victorious. And paradoxically, it was really um, the Mongols who, who broke up the, the, the Viking Ukraine, the Swedish Viking Ukraine into three components because the um, because of emigration it split into today's Belarus, Ukraine and Russia itself. Then came the Polish Commonwealth of Lithuania, Poland and Lithuania that you know I'm sure all about and uh, the infamous deluge in the 17th century so eloquently captured in the novels by Sienkiewicz that I started reading about 40 years ago, and I still haven't stopped, actually 50 by now. Uh, much of this uh, takes place in Zaporozhia. And if you uh, follow the news today, then Mariupol, which is where the biggest battle 
has been taking place since the beginning of Putin's invasion is located somewhere here. And it's all the historical land of the Cossacks who were never quite subdued even by the very militarily skilled Poles. Um, here you have one of the most um, delightful large oil paintings. These are the um, Cossacks uh, writing a letter to the Sultan in Istanbul, inventing um, more and more juicy obscenities, um, inviting him what he should do with himself. In the, in the Polish Ukrainian history, a central role will always belong to Bogdan Khmelnytsky, whose insurrection of 1648 against the, uh, the Polish Commonwealth um, destabilized uh, the, the situation enormously. And in fact, um, um, here you see, uh, by the way, this is obviously Khmelnytsky, but this is Tuhai Bey, who is a Crimean Tatar with whom Khmelnytsky allied himself against the Poles. Ultimately, the two um, fell apart. And so Khmelnytsky, um, in fact, made an alliance with Russia. And it is only then that Russia enters the scene um, as a political player. So if uh, Putin and um, all those people who like to repeat his wisdom uh, say that Ukraine's history is essentially Russia's history, that's simply utterly and totally false. Uh, then came, of course, the Polish partitions. Here you see Maria Theresa. Uh, this is um, the uh, last king of Poland, King Poniatowski. This is Joseph II, Frederick the Great, right? Um, they divided uh, Poland, and it was then that actually Poland, uh, that actually Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, which until then had been controlled by Poland, fell under the jurisdiction of the Russian czars. And here I want to make a, another quick um, sort of moment, a point about how language and nationality are two separate things. And I think uh, Mr. Putin, like many others before him, makes, has made the mistake of presuming that one essentially means the other, you speak Russian, therefore you're Russian, where you live, therefore it's Russia, therefore I have the right to conquer that land. That simply is false. In fact, the future, the, the, the evolution, the, development of Ukraine was to a very great extent uh, governed by uh, or driven by foreigners. For instance, the great city of Luhansk was established by a Scotsman, a British subject who um, brought industry, um, established that whole city. Uh, the same is true about what's now called Donetsk, used to be called Uvesovka, also Stalin, of course, another British industrialist. The great city of Odessa, which is still awaiting a major onslaught, if it ever happens, uh, from Putin's um, troops. Uh, this was um, made great by Duc de Richelieu, who had to escape from France because of the French Revolution. And he made his uh, career in... in um, in Odessa, who subsequently had several French mayors that who, who made it into a flourishing international port. These are a few maps that show how the, the, the two forces of East and West kept clashing over, over Ukraine. I will move uh, swiftly through this because um, um, as I said, the clock is ticking. So here, obviously, you see um, a, 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 the Ukraine that um, um, existed um, as part of the USSR. Now, um, I'm sure you have all heard of it, um, but uh, it's really important to remind ourselves that although Ukraine has 
a very large chunk of all farming land in Europe, the Bolsheviks nevertheless managed to organize at least three large famines, one in the 20s, one in the 30s, and one in the immediate after World War II era. Um, the estimates of how many people died in those waves uh, differ, as you can imagine. There is a kind of victimology going on. There is a battle between uh, people who want to show their scars. Um, but um, I think a reasonable estimate is somewhere between six and eight million people, which is all the more impressive if you consider that um, really the most fertile land in the world is, is disproportionately is disproportionately concentrated in today's Ukraine. The horror of the war um, in Ukraine is well known to everyone. And this was followed by a period after the war, after World War II, when um, the Ukrainians um, did not accept their reabsorption in the Soviet Union and with uh, often uh, poorly designed assistance from the West launched um, a um, kind of guerrilla war against the Soviet authorities past, well, after World War II. Again, the numbers of, of how much, uh, how many people died are difficult to come by. But I think if I estimate that about 100,000 people died uh, in combat, meaning Ukrainians fighting against elements of the NKVD, I think I am not probably too far from the truth. And so now we are in the post-war era. And um, as you can see, Crimea is, um, was already in 54 um, um, made part of uh, Ukraine. So when the Soviet Union dissolved, it really was in a uh, pathetic state uh, because um, it inherited a sort of heap of rusting industry um, that produced uh, products for which there was no real market anywhere. It was, it was hopelessly obsolete. It probably uh, reflected what um, the, the, sweet, the, um, the Scottish and the Welsh uh, British um, industrialists brought in in the 18th and 19th centuries. And of course, by now, in, in South Korea, in, in, in um, the rest of the world, there were products that were much, much more of much higher quality and much more competitive. Now, um, Ukraine had not only this kind of industry, um, a heap of rusting um, stuff, that was not competitive. It also had many nu nuclear weapons. And the United States, understandably, and the rest of the world were very concerned about uh, nuclear terrorism. And therefore, the United States with the British agreed to become parties to a memorandum that was signed in Budapest in 94. And this memorandum essentially told the Ukrainians, here represented by Kuchma, this is obviously Yeltsin, Clinton and Major, uh, the, the memorandum promised that um, if they gave up all their nuclear arsenal, then they, the, the signatories, meaning Russia, Britain and the United States would guarantee Ukrainian sovereign territory as untouchable and that they would not only uh, never commit an act of aggression, they would not even threaten to use force, they would not even impose economic sanctions. So I think the Ukrainians felt fairly satisfied that this uh, Budapest memorandum essentially um, made them um, secure. And on top of it, three years later, they in fact signed another statement, this one with um, 
just just bilateral agreement between Ukraine and Russia that again stipulated that they had no claim on each other's territory. And it's roughly <clears throat> uh, at this time that Putin emerges at the top of the pyramid of power and the whole Western alliance rushed to embrace him after 10 years of um, Yeltsin, who had become a pitiful alcoholic, basically incoherent after 11 in the morning. Uh, this young man who doesn't drink, is an athlete and so on, was welcomed. And more importantly, by now, Russia had given birth to this whole new class of individuals called the oligarchs. And now the Americans, the British, the Germans, the French were all longing to have the oligarch money um, deposited in their banks so that their capital cities became the financial hubs of this planet. The British were particularly active in that regard. And um, after the Patriot Act was passed uh, in uh, following 9-11, um, which imposed uh, restrictions on, on, on banking secrecy, uh, um, there was a wholesale escape of the Russian money from New York to, to London. And in order to be able to buy their visas, to buy their uh, permits and so on, um, the uh, oligarchs uh, gave a lot of money uh, both to labor and to the Tories. Throughout this time, the West, contrary to the current Russian propaganda, slumbered. It really, throughout the 1990s, it had expressed no desire in dealing with Ukraine. The first time the West began paying attention to Ukraine was around 2000, when Kuchma was recorded by his chief bodyguard, whom you can see on the right side, as ordering an execution, the murder, killing of uh, one of his uh, most successful critics, a, a, a man obviously of Georgian origin, but um, a Ukrainian citizen. Um, it was also in, in this context that um, Russia already started asserting itself as a power that simply would not tolerate any attempt by Ukraine to, to um, 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 get closer to Europe, never mind NATO, even the European Union. And so when this new man appeared on the scene, Yushchenko, whose wife was American and who had uh, many ambitions of taking Ukraine swiftly um, toward, toward Western Europe, he was um, uh, very nearly murdered by a um, person who subsequently then uh, escaped to Russia and uh, accepted Russian citizenship. The great demonstrations that sent things into motion uh, that Putin constantly talks about, those demonstrations at Maidan, had really nothing to do with Russia. It had nothing to do, they had nothing to do with the European Union or NATO. They had everything to do with corruption. And the person who initiated them was this gentleman of Afghan origin, who with the use of his Facebook account, called on his friends to join him in a small demonstration on Maidan where they would be protesting corruption. And it was this event that ultimately grew into a massive display of Ukraine's desire to in fact be part of Europe rather than of uh, some sort of Novaya Rossiya, uh, as Putin started uh, suggesting. And uh, it was the brutality that the security forces displayed against this gathering of completely normal people 
not CIA agents as Putin and many others uh, who uh, follow his line now say, um, it was a completely legitimate expression of the people's desires. And um, uh, in reaction to this, Putin used that opportunity to obviously annex, um, annex Crimea and uh, he started a war in, in Eastern Ukraine. The West yet again slumbered through this time. It was exactly as Putin would now say, a feat. It imposed sanctions, but did really nothing and did nothing even when Putin started building this monstrous bridge across, across the Kerch Strait. Here you see the, uh, the Kerch Strait from Russia to Crimea. And uh, what is so objectionable about the, uh, the, the bridge, by the way, note Mariupol and Berdyansk, these, uh, these are two um, um, ports um, through which um, Ukraine can communicate with the world markets. It supplies lots of uh, um, sunflower oil, uh, wheat, it basically feeds um, uh, Middle East and so on. So this bridge, which you can see here, was deliberately designed in such a manner that large ships can go underneath it. So it immediately was a kind of a creeping blockade of Ukraine and the West again said nothing. In the 19th century, when Britain still was the guardian of the freedom of the seas, this never would have been tolerated. So uh, Putin's uh, occupation of uh, Luhansk and Donetsk, uh, that is Donbas, um, I thought was a fulfillment of his dreams. Uh, it was, uh, many experts said, uh, this is like a frozen conflict and most likely he's not going to go anywhere because he basically uh, demonstrated to the world that uh, Ukraine doesn't control its territory and therefore, it will never be accepted into NATO. So that uh, all this concern about uh, somehow Ukraine uh, bringing NATO um, into the neighborhood of Russia is just fake because um, Ukraine um, with um, uh, Donbas under Russian control um, could never have been invited into, into NATO. <clears throat> Nevertheless, for reasons that um, I am unable fully to understand, he decided that this was not enough. He was going to swallow the whole country. And so in the fall of uh, the previous year and into the winter of 2022, he began carrying out these large scale um, buildups that were immediately publicized by the Western intelligence community. And true to their um, um, tradition, the propagandists are uh, not only in, in Moscow, but in Prague and in Budapest and elsewhere, they said, ah, they were wrong when they talked about Saddam Hussein and his weapons of mass destruction. They're wrong even now. But Putin understood this much about history. He's kind of obsessed with World War II. And he knew that winter is harsh, but what is actually desperately difficult uh, for war fighting in Ukraine is mud. The Ukrainians called it Rasputnica. And if you ask any German soldier, they will tell you that uh, the cold was really horrible, but it was the mud that made it impossible for them to advance. And so Putin, when he decided to launch a war, he knew that the clock was really ticking. And to the surprise of many people, although not Western intelligence services, he launched his campaign in the hope of being in Kiev in three to five days and having the country under complete control 
in something like a week or 10 days. And so he launched this uh, hopelessly obsolete campaign that really is, is incredibly dumb, you know, uh, just to advance with tanks uh, without any infantry or any air cover. I am just a second lieutenant of the Czech army from the early 1970s, but I can tell you that even I would know better. And here you have Rasputnica now in uh, March and April uh, 2022, just like the Germans before them, the Russian armor can't simply drive across the Ukrainian land. People should have told him. Uh, what I'm sure he also underestimated uh, is the leadership uh, that uh, grew into truly Churchillian dimensions. They thought this is some sort of a Russian speaking comedian will just, um, you know, um, slam our fist on the table and like Dubček and Svoboda and um, all those people, they will just wet their pants and uh, obedi and, 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 and obey. But uh, he proved to be um, cut from a different type of cloth. And so the consequence is that the Russian army has lost its uh, reputation um, there is a frozen situation that I'm unable to say anything creative about, but what I can, I think, predict is that um, ultimately the solution will have to be political. And it seems to me that the first signs are pretty good, because when at the very beginning of the conflict, Lavrov attempted to start spreading his lies, everybody left and except for i think syria and uh, venezuela i think cuba uh, possibly north korea and that's about it whereas when zelensky addressed the same audience they stood up and applauded so here are a few uh, well two bullet points that i would suggest are worth uh, considering and it's especially the last one where I just want to say that although Putin is called president, he actually conducts himself like a king. And being a king gives you many advantages. You don't need to worry about uh, parliaments and laws and police and courts. But the problem is that kings too have their obligations. Um, you have to have uh, proper successors. Uh, you have to prevent famine. And most importantly, if you launch uh, a war, you have to be victorious. A defeated king is a wounded king who can be uh, dethroned. Uh, what I think, obviously, uh, he Putin has also created in, in Europe is that he, if there was any doubt whatsoever about Ukrainian nation, uh, contrary to liars like uh, Klaus and his ilk, uh, you, can, you can see it in action. These people who go to battle uh, in, in uh, much smaller numbers against the Russian armor uh, without fearing it, simply motivated by patriotism and of course, great Western support, those people demonstrate the existence of Ukrainian civil society. And finally, he also completely shut down all those puppets of his, like Orban in Hungary, even Kaczynski, who admittedly was never entirely a puppet of Mr. Putin, but he was so, such a sort of harsh critic of Brussels that you often wondered whether he wasn't doing somebody else's bidding. But it, it is now Poland that is on the ramparts of the Western effort to, to, um, to um, uh, assist the Ukrainians. So I think I would, um, um, I think this is my penultimate slide. I would say that um, if you, uh, let's say, look at today's Ukraine, uh, Austria and ask Austria if it would like to uh, reconquer Prague and Northern Italy and uh, 
big chunks of uh, Hungary and Balkans, I think the Ukrainians would say, no, thank you very much. We have done much better for ourselves without uh, the Habsburg Empire's possessions. When the Habsburgs were so proud that uh, the sun never, never went down uh, behind their possessions, uh, the, the, the Austrians today, one of the richest country in the European Union, are doing much better without their colonies. I think the same should be a lesson for Putin if he now looks at Belgium, if he looks at Spain, those countries that's really found their way uh, into uh, the club of some of the most prosperous countries in Europe after they had freed themselves from their thirst for desire for colonies and land. And I think this is uh, my very last slide, which is just a sort of in, in memory of the fact that Susanna, Viet and I, um, many, many years ago, in fact, half a century ago, studied philosophy in Prague. And we spent a lot of time reading Hegel. And uh, one of the most um, persuasive ideas that I found in his otherwise, for me, very difficult to understand uh, work is that it is solely by risking life that freedom is obtained. And I think the Ukrainians have now been showing it to us for more than a month. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Igor, for uh, giving us this kind of large view of, of the situation in Ukraine, helping us understand better where uh, Ukraine comes from, what its history is, and uh, helping us understand uh, a number of the key events uh, leading up to this, and, and of course, since the conflict has broken out. Uh, there's a lot to digest here, <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm going to invite our audience to, to pose questions either through the chat or um, uh, by raising your hand, and I'll, I'll try and call on you. Uh, it may take me a little while to find you if you're just waving, uh, but uh, either, either using the chat or, or, or the hand waving should allow me to get to it. I think one or two questions did come into the chat. I'm going to take my prerogative as, as moderator and, and pose one question to Igor first. Um, with hindsight, of course, uh, uh, the way the West reacted to uh, Russian aggression in Crimea and, and Eastern Ukraine um, uh, after Maidan, it, it seems incredibly short-sighted and stupid. Uh, how, how do you, as a historian looking back in the short view, uh, understand how this failure happened? Was it mostly just the Russian oil, everyone wanting to keep getting cheap, you know, relatively cheap gas and oil from Russia, and this caused them to put aside all their concerns, or were there additional political concerns uh, that might have motivated uh, the West to just not do much in reaction to, to the aggression in Crimea and, and Donbass? Well, I think at the time, um, throughout the 1990s, the West simply um, accepted the notion that Ukraine belonged to Russia. You know, I think that um, if you actually ask somebody like Henry Kissinger in the 70s and 80s um, what they thought about the chances of Poland or Romania, for that matter, to free themselves from Russian influence, from Soviet influence, they would say that the, first of all, they would officially declare that the United States did not accept zones of influence. So they, they pretended that Poland and Romania were sovereign countries. The reality was that they all believed that map is destiny. <laughs> that where you are on the map determines, limits, if you will, your freedom of action. And so this is the view that the West accepted. This is the view that the West in, um, um, applied in the 1990s. And it so much desired um, um, Russian oil. And I think um, uh, most importantly, uh, oligarch money and, and um, oligarch uh, presence in its capital cities, 
that it was willing to accept Russia's primacy over that land, despite the fact, and this may surprise you, Chris, every <laughs> single president of Ukraine announced, including those who were clearly puppets of the Kremlin, announced that their objective is, is in the future to bring Ukraine into NATO and the European Union. And in fact, Klaus visited Kiev, and there he said, that when the time came, the Czech Republic would be the first to support Ukraine's application for NATO and EU membership. <laughs> I guess not all of these state statements age well. Uh, a question came in, I think that was sent to me, maybe inadvertently, but asking your opinion about uh, uh, Angela Merkel's leadership in, in Europe in dealing with Putin. Well, I, I, I have to tell you, I always found her to be a very impressive leader. Um, I think um, at, at, at the height of her influence, I considered her the most talented European politician. And when Trump appeared on the scene, I thought she was the most talented uh, leader uh, in the West. Um, uh, so, um, but when it when certainly when it when it came to to Russia and Ukraine, she had an impossible job, because Germany had committed such unspeakable atrocities against both the Russian people, the Ukrainian people, on Russian and Ukrainian territory, that, as you know, um, it was impossible for her to you know, suggest that Germany would do anything but provide milk or, you know, food <laughs> or, you know, blankets maybe at most. So she was, she was burdened by German history, by the German guilt, which is very real and can never be forgotten. And she would be the first one to tell you that it must not be forgotten. So it was her limiting factor. For sure, it's amazing that we've seen, isn't it, uh, just in the past few weeks, a, a sea change in uh, German politics, right, in the approach to uh, defense budgets and, and the need to have a more, you know, uh, action-capable German army. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Putin, you know. <laughs> this is what he has managed to do, you know. He, I mean, he... He presents it as a special military operation by Russia against Ukraine. In reality, it's a war on Ukraine, of course, but it's not a war only on Ukraine. He has also uh, declared war apparently on Switzerland because Switzerland has declared it, it, you know, itself not to be neutral. He has upset Sweden and Norway, Sweden, the traditionally very neutral country, even in World War II, for instance, even South Korea, even Taiwan, and countries of this kind, countries that normally sit on the fence and try to stay away from conflicts in which they have no, no um, real stake, uh, even, even they came forward and denounced this aggression. So I think that um, it, it is something uh, for which uh, um, obviously Putin personally, but most importantly, most tragically, Russia herself will pay because we now have these radicals who refuse to allow a course on Dostoevsky or performance <laughs> by a Russian orchestra or a Russian opera singer is boycotted in in, in places, I think that's 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 outrageous, personally. But uh, you know, this is what Mr. Putin has done. Indeed, uh, one of our uh, audience people asks if you see uh, any chance for the truth to get out to uh, the Russian people. Of course, Putin has really uh, clamped down completely on what remained of independent media, uh, and and Putin seems to really retain his popularity and be able to control the narrative. Is, is there any way that can change? Well, I think uh, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty is still targeting Russia and who wants to know they can find out the truth. Uh, 
Um, I understand that um, um, one should not be addressing only um, intellectual elites, um, um, Prasko Kavarno in some Russian version um, in, in, um, in the Russian Federation. I understand that. But I think that if, if, you, if you really want to know the truth, um, you can probably, you can probably um, learn it. Um, it, is, it is deeply depressing to read that before the launching of the operation, according to Levada, uh, Putin's uh, approval rating was about 65, 69%. Um, a few days ago, it was 83. So that, that, of course, is deeply, deeply depressing. But of course, um, you have to see it against the background of the fact that close to half a million of the best and most talented Russians have left the country. And these are the people with the most exquisite talents and education and artists and, and uh, computer scientists and entrepreneurs, people who have some portable skills, people who can you know, land in Germany, Paris, New York, and start a business, right? These people have, by voting with their feet, to use Lenin's term, they have impoverished Russia. And again, Putin is responsible. Uh, another question from the chat. What, if anything, do you think would keep Putin from using chemical weapons if he becomes increasingly desperate with uh, the lack of success with his campaign? I think that the use of chemical weapons is um, generally regarded as so barbaric that it's completely beyond the pale. And I think uh, as long as there is no genuine military value in that, um, I think he would be absolutely irrational to use it because that could well be one of the triggers that could intensify direct um, NATO involvement in, in support of Ukraine. So I think that if there is any element of rationality left in him, I think he would abstain from uh, use of chemical weapons. Again, yes, he is desperate, but how is he going to be less desperate when the whole world charges him with barbaric assault on a concentration of civilians with chemical weapons. Thank you. Uh, one of our readers, uh, one of our uh, audience members, uh, reacting to what you presented about uh, the Budapest Memorandum, if, if these four countries all signed an agreement that <laughs> banned acts of aggression towards Ukraine, uh, then wouldn't it be incumbent upon the signatories to react if some aggression was committed? Yes, it would be, but the signatories carefully point out that it's only a memorandum. <laughs> ah. So that's different from a treaty then. Exactly. And therefore, it has no legal validity, they argue, other than just declaring an intention. But it's not legally <laughs> binding on the UK and the US. And of course, it's exactly this kind of hypocrisy that, that cheapens uh, the international space and in essentially invites people like Putin to do beastly things because they think that everything will be ultimately somehow maneuvered around, just like the Budapest Memorandum. Well, this is a, a real uh, note to yourself. Make sure you don't stop with a memorandum, get, get a treaty, right? <laughs> if it really matters. Right. Uh, here's a question uh, from our audience. Uh, is the current war in Ukraine, a kind of Berlin airlift moment uh, that might consolidate uh, NATO and, and, uh, East, uh, and European solidarity and trigger a kind of uh, modern deterrent strategy uh, that would involve maybe mobilization of civil society. Yes, I think I'm, um, I'm I think I don't, I don't make this up when I say that I am often critical about um, Western approach Western approaches to East Central Europe. Um, I think um, the immediate after World War II era was, I think, mismanaged. I think the end of the Cold War was also not managed as well as it could have been. But I have to say that if I were a professor, uh, 
in a position to uh, give um, marks uh, to uh, international players, I would give the West and the United States specifically an A+. I think it was absolutely heroic on their part uh, already from November 2021 to start you know, publishing the evidence of, of the military concentrations, risking, risking the, the, the sort of humorous reactions on the part of those who recalled how the West and again, specifically the United States had misrepresented the situation in, in the uh, Iraqi case. And they proceeded despite this kind of um, um, attempt to humiliate the West until it turned out that they were right all along. And I think it really was gutsy, it was courageous. I think um, in, in many ways they could have endangered possibly some sources they had uh, uh, if, if this was partly based on human sources. So I think it was really the first time that I saw this concept of defend forward replacing containment, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, it really, to me, shows that in the cyberspace, the, the notion that, you know, this land is mine and this land is yours um, is now obsolete. And people who understand satellites and that sort of thing, they tell me that each side is constantly poking into the other side systems, not necessarily because they wish to, to do harm, but because they need to do so in order to see what the other side is doing to them. Right. And, and that's why it's called defend forward, you know. Yeah. Um, so you, you point out the limitations of, of Putin's king-like uh, authority in Russia. And one of our, our audience members asks, uh, how can Russia find a different path forward? Uh, will it take a revolution or major civil unrest from within, or is there some other way? Well, as, as we all know, Russia has a brilliant history in defending its land against the Swedes, the Poles, the, the French, the, uh, the Nazis. Uh, but it doesn't have such a good record in defending itself against domestic tyrants. It, it in fact, turns out that uh, domestic tyrants have been uh, fairly secure in their rule over their people. No Stauffenberg ever, uh, ever appeared in, in the uh, long years of Stalin's um, um, decimation of, of the um, Red Army, right? Um, uh, tens of thousands of utterly innocent people tortured, murdered, and not one Stauffenberg. So um, if we also consider that Putin's popularity has, has risen, during the, um, the special military action in Ukraine, then we need to be skeptical about the chances of an internal revolution. You know? mm -hmm. So I am, I, am, I am not able to, to, to express any, any degree of optimism. Uh, I think that Putin is probably well, well protected at home. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of our audience members has a kind of hypothetical question for you. Uh, would the autocracy of Russia and the big Asia country, I think maybe China is what is uh, in mind here, would they be less harmful to the world and to humanity if uh, economic sanctions um, had been maybe imposed earlier as a kind of preventative measure instead of as chemotherapy uh, treating an already sick patient? <laughs> Yes. Well, it's, of course, a great question. And uh, this is what um, the Ukrainians had suggested. But um, I don't know how it would have been accepted by uh, the European audiences, and certainly by Americans. Uh, I think uh, what they needed uh, to see were Russian bombs falling on Ukrainian civilians. It breaks my heart to say it, but that is the brutal truth. Uh, 
that they needed to be shaken out of their slumber uh, by the horror, by the absurdity of tanks yet again being unleashed on completely innocent civilians. And of course, that they were also incompetently led, that's a different issue. But that they were unleashed at all was so horrific that the Europeans and the Americans said, all right, if it means I have to pay $70 now to fill up my car, and maybe that's a price I need to pay if I can, if I can absorb it. But so the idea is very good, but I, I don't know that it would have been politically feasible. Exactly. Um, one of our uh, uh, audience members, this is from SVU, Nebraska, uh, refers to um, uh, editorial in the New York Times by Brett Stevens a couple of days ago, what if Putin didn't miscalculate, uh, in which he explores the hypothesis that maybe Putin, uh, what he has had in mind all along is really just to seize gas deposits and mineral wealth in eastern Ukraine and, you know, basically cordon that off and leave uh, the rest of Ukraine as a, a, you know, an impoverished remainder. Yeah, but he already had that. <laughs> he, already, he already had Donetsk and Luhansk, he already controlled that, right? So this is why so many people were willing to, to um, take the risk and predict that there would be no war, you know, that despite the military concentrations, there would be ultimately no war, because they thought he already has that one chunk of territory, which could be conceivably considered to have some value. Of course, we all know that in the 21st century, value is now in manipulating information, not in pumping oil or gas from the ground, especially now in the 21st century, when we all know that the European Union has firm dates set for when it's going to cut off completely all carbon from, from from energy production. So um, I don't know how that could have been worth his effort uh, to gain control over something he already possessed. Uh, one of our audience members asks if you see this being an impetus to the development of the Czech military, where I guess the budget is, uh, military budget has only been about 1.35% uh, of of um, you know, GDP and, and uh, uh, they have only a small reserve force. Did, might this accelerate it to a commitment of, of 2% uh, and to uh, expand the reserves and, and its combat readiness? Yes, I think, um, I think so. But um, I, I think this, this really underlines the, the, whole, the whole sequence of events. I think, I think it shows how important it was for the Czech Republic to become part of NATO, how important it was for Poland to become part of NATO and the rest of uh, East Central Europe. Because imagine if Estonia were not in NATO, if Poland were not in NATO, I bet those two countries would not be sitting on their hands as they would see missiles flying closer to their borders they would be now probing across the border if they were not NATO members. It is only NATO membership that slows them down a bit. Although there was an Estonian Air Force general who looked at the performance of, of Russia in Ukraine and he said, what is it that we have been so worried about? <laughs> Darling. And that's you? Estonia. Thank you. Yeah. That's very interesting, so I'm just listening um, away. Let me see here. Uh, someone is asking if you see this this conflict as a possibility for more uh, cooperation. We've already seen on a small scale the way uh, it is actually brought uh, right and left together in some contexts, both in the U.S. and in Europe. Do you do you see a potential for uh, uh, maybe mending some of the the division that's come across with events like Brexit within uh, the politics of the West? Yes, absolutely. Um, so not only has this uh, shut down the most egregious types in, in Europe, uh, like, like uh, Orban, 
uh, not only has it reminded the, uh, uh, the, the Polish rebels around Kaczynski's peace party uh, of the values uh, of, of NATO and the European Union, uh, I think the war has also had a, tragically really, uh, it took a war to make it possible for Congress to start working together. This is really the first time in years that the Democrats and the Republicans are able to agree on something. Right? They all vote for military aid to Ukraine. It is remarkable. Yeah. Again, think of the alleged brilliant chess player Putin as for years we've been hearing how brilliant he is. He's lost everything, even if he you know, conquers the rest of the country in the, in the next five days. I think he will have lost this war. Um, someone from our audience asks, how, uh, how does this war end? Uh, what, what has to happen for this war to come to an end? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question and I don't have a good answer. I think uh, ultimately it will have to be a political decision to end it. Um, because it seems that there is no, um, th that basically no event on the battlefield could be so decisive as to result in cessation of hostilities. And therefore, it will have to be a political, politically negotiated settlement. But uh, exactly when it will happen, I don't know. Uh, someone asking here, how do you evaluate the Bucharest uh, Declaration of 2008, in which Georgia and Ukraine uh, expressed their intention to join NATO. Well, it wasn't Georgia and and um, and Ukraine expressing intention. What was so shocking was the United States insisting that it would support this declaration against um, or without any consultations with um, its NATO allies. And um, certainly Putin has zeroed in on this event and he keeps presenting it as the casus belli. But we all know that um, um, uh, everybody rejected it and, and the Americans basically left Bucharest with egg on their face because it was obviously premature. They shouldn't have brought it up without consulting. And it was a political defeat for the Americans and for the Ukrainians and Georgians. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure about this. Maybe you'll have some insight. One of our, our audience members asks if uh, Russia's form of government might not be described better as sultanistic as opposed to a purely Western uh, or authoritarian uh, or autarky. Yeah, well, uh, I think that's probably right. Uh, there is an element of the um, sort of Ottoman Ottoman uh, regard for uh, the one sultan who is the embodiment not only of the temporal power, but also of some spiritual authority, because you, you know, of course, that Putin has now discovered religion, right? And, <laughs> and he, when he met George W. Bush he, um, in, at his farm in Texas, he told him that uh, that, that the two have one thing in common, and that is love of Jesus Christ. And he then, he then gave him his baptismal cross that he said, his, um, um, he said he was secretly baptized, you know, this, this child of a KGB officer was secret. I'm, I'm not saying it's not true. It very well may have happened. But, you know, he's also a spiritual authority in Russia. Of course, he also is a spiritual authority because he protects the country against gays and gay marriage and all the other uh, horror that the West uh, seeks to impose upon Russia to destroy it. Uh, was it a mistake for Biden to have said already prior to the invasions that under no circumstances would the US send troops? I think um, I, at the time I, I thought it was premature but um, given, the, um, uh, given Putin's ability and his uh, spokesman's ability to bring up nuclear weapons, I think it was the prudent thing to do. Mm -hmm. So that there would be no doubt whatsoever about this. 
although there were in fact uh, US trainers as recently as January on, but they were very close to the Western border, you know, still they were in Ukraine. It needs to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. uh, you alluded before to uh, the, the way that Putin's popularity allegedly actually has gone up since the beginning of the conflict. Uh, how, to what do you attribute this popularity given uh, that there must be, uh, you know, economic hardship now, um, and of course, uh, a clamp down on civic freedoms? Yeah. Well, um, I think it's a generally um, accepted phenomenon that when the shooting starts, uh, people rally around the flag and even, even unpopular American presidents see their popularity going up. Whether it will last, um, only history, only the future will tell us really. So I don't know, but um, I think it's a normal and relatively predictable thing. But again, who are the people who admire Putin so much for the mess that he had made for them, for themselves, for himself, and most importantly for Russia? They're certainly not the young people who are leaving the country in huge numbers right now. Uh, a question about whether uh, Putin's tactic of uh, uh, emphasizing denazification as a justification for the campaign in Ukraine uh, was was that a miscalculation? Did that not uh, end up in alienating more people who might have possibly been sympathetic to uh, his claims? Yes, I think it was probably a miscalculation vis-a-vis -vis the Western audiences, but I think he he um, addressed the, the, the Russian audiences. And for them, of course, the defining element of Soviet slash Russian Federation history is, is the Soviet slash Russian heroism in World War II. So any reference to fighting Nazis um, is going to find fertile soil. I was um, 18 in 1968 when the Russians came and I can tell you that I am totally convinced that it, it was true that some of the units at least had been told that they were going to Czechoslovakia to fight against the, the uh, Bundeswehr, which they claimed their officers had told them had invaded or was about to invade Czechoslovakia. So these things um, are sort of eternally um, relied upon tools of influencing Russian opinion by Russians. You, you've indicated, and, and many people have assessed, that, that uh, you know, almost unquestionably, uh, Russia emerges from this diminished. It, do you think it's possible that Russia emerges from this having more or less definitively lost its status as a great power? Well, um, I would like to um, sort of go back to the three points of Mr. Strakov, who says, you know, Russia, in order to exist, needs to be dignified, to be dignified, she needs land, and to acquire land, she needs to be feared, you know, so fear, fear is a hugely important component. But if little Estonia uh, no longer fears the Russian armed forces. I don't really know how Russia can proceed into the future. So all this talk about these, you know, hypersonic cruise missile that Putin developed, and all this brilliant investment in rebuilding the armed forces, we can now see the armed forces in the Rasputnitsa. Um, mess of Ukraine, unable to advance forward without borrowing tractors of the farmers in Ukraine. So um, I think that it's it's entirely possible that Russia will have been diminished. Yes. All right. Um, I know I still have a few questions in the chat, but I, I've been cued that there's some people who have been trying to break through. Uh, uh, otherwise, I see Jack Kay's hand up, uh, and I see Milan Kohout. So I'll ask Jack, uh, Jack J. I'm sorry, first, and after him, Milan Kohout, if they would like to speak. Jack, are you there? 
Uh, what kind of a grade would you give Joseph Biden in his performance in relation to what has happened? Uh, and assuming that you give it a good grade, how is it, do you think that the American people have not given him a good grade? Well, I can't speak for the American people. I can only speak for myself. I think he has done much better than I had feared uh, any American president would have done in a crisis like this. If you um, look at the memoirs of uh, Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin, uh, who describes in considerable detail how he came in the evening to inform uh, President Johnson that um, 500,000 troops of the uh, Warsaw Pact were currently invading Czechoslovakia and how President Johnson yawned. Uh, I think uh, what's, what's um, happened uh, since uh, the fall of 2021 um, with this president in the White House has been entirely different. I think he's consistently been saying what was going to happen. It did happen despite his warnings and he drew consequences for Russia for having violated repeatedly those warnings. I don't know what else he could have done given that um, Russia is a nuclear superpower and we still live in a mutually assured destruction environment. So from my point of view, I would have to say that he has done as well as he could have done. Thank you. Uh, Milan, you, you have a question. Milan, you are muted. Yeah, you have to oh, unmute you. Sorry, sorry. Hello, Igor. Uh, you know that I will come with some kind of a dissent point of view, which is very useful. You, uh, you presented uh, your presentation very convincingly, but you were like skipping something which is inconvenient, you know, in that. And I have a question if it's not contraproductive, you know. You said that uh, the whole world is against uh, Russia. I made the calculation the other day, and it looks like more than half of the people on the earth didn't condemn Russian attack on Ukraine. If you count the number of people, like China, India, Pakistan, North Korea, Iran, South Africa, uh, you mentioned Cuba, you know, etc. When you count all those people together, it's more than half of inhabitants on the earth. And I wonder if we are like sort of dealing with these kind of big geopolitical uh, issues and we are like sort of skipping certain facts that it, it is very contraproductive. You know, I, my mother was born in Ukraine. You know, my uh, grandfather's great is there. When you presented, you know, uh, about the Ukrainian history, I would have uh, a lot comments, but there is no time about that. But you skipped certain inconvenient facts like collaboration of Ukrainians during Second World War, which I know from my family, you know, and like, tens of thousands of Ukrainian men following SS units of Hitler, you know, and participating <laughs> on killing Jews, etc. But uh, I want uh, just the question, when you see, when I see the map of Russia, I am, uh, as the artist, I am uh, questioning myself, isn't that something which is so sort of driving global corporations to just get it because it's such a huge piece of property on the earth you know and i have heard it even from some uh, ex-politicians in uh, american history who were saying you know that russians don't have the right to have such a huge piece of property and mm -hmm. if we like don't if we close the our eyes and just you know, see it as the one-dimensional aggression of Russia against Ukraine, you know, and skipping, of course, the ex uh, expansion of NATO, <laughs> which was horrible, you know. I think it's very counterproductive. Okay. So, 
Oh, oh sorry, no. sorry. I, I am, can talk I am, for hours. You know me, you know. <laughs> I am I am now an old man and um I can't remember all your questions, you know. So yeah, yeah. I have to take it uh quickly, uh, step by step. I think you're absolutely right that there are very large countries that sit on the fence. Uh but uh if you mention China, I think Putin had expected an all-out support from China. Instead, he discovered that China simply wishes to remain neutral. If you, if you mention India and Pakistan, well, you know, India refused to denounce Soviet invasion of Afghanistan uh, in 1979 too. So these are the so-called non-aligned countries and there is really nothing new about that. You're absolutely right to mention the ugly past the ugly component of Ukrainian history involving collaboration. Um, you know, there was a lot of members, many Frenchmen joined the SS during World War II. Many Danes joined the SS, many Norwegians, many Slovaks. There was a Czech in the SS and it was pretty hard for them to get in because they were racially not really good enough for the SS, right? So there were many countries where this ugliness is not really properly examined. Luckily enough, that when luckily enough, when it comes to Ukraine, we know a great deal about it. And the fact that the country was able to elect a Jewish president is a remarkable achievement. I think it's a remarkable achievement for Ukraine, given its ugly past during World War II. Thank you. Uh, Noel, would you like to ask a question? Oh, thank you very much, Christopher. And um, thank you uh, on behalf of those of us in the United Kingdom staying up late for a fascinating and a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, my question is along the lines of, is this a lifeline to NATO with respect to its relationship with countries like Austria, Finland, and Sweden, whilst formal membership may not actually occur, will this mean that the free, the liberal, the democratic countries of Europe will be even closer in terms of their defence and security and cyber relationships? Yes, they, they absolutely will be. And um, I think um, only a few days passed um, after Putin's uh, aggression on the 24th of February and a Swedish general flew to Washington, Swedish general, where he pleaded for the United States to build up its numbers in Europe. <laughs> you know, this, this tells you something, what it's like to live in the neighborhood of the Russian Federation in 2022, right? A Swedish general asks the Americans to build up their numbers in Europe, right? After we had all been complaining about American militarism and um, America's um, sort of intuitive um, militaristic reactions to crises around the world. So I think many things have changed and they have, some have changed for the better. And that is especially among the, the uh, now, I think very tightly united NATO alliance that no longer would have those defend, you know, doubters um, like Orban and, and, and others who uh, could not, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of find it in them to, um, to be, loyal to, to uh, the Western alliance that really gave them a lifeline when it came to stability in the post-Cold War environment. If they now had been on their own, nobody would have given five bucks for their future. Uh, maybe let's jump in here. I believe Milan raised the question of NATO expansion and maybe suggested that there was a mistake. And we have uh, someone in, in the chat uh, quoting Noam Chomsky as someone who has uh, blamed, uh, you know, some of the current problems on, on the NATO expansion. 
Uh, would you just like to weigh in on that, Igor, uh, whether... Well, uh, um, yes, this is a well-known uh, misreading of, of a, um, um, a conversation between Jim Baker, who was the then Secretary of State, and uh, Helmut Kohl and, um, and Gorbachev. The three were discussing the future of Germany and whether when Germany united, the Eastern part would also de facto become part of NATO. And it was in that context that Jim Baker said that NATO would not, and I think the, this um, Stefan uh, correctly quotes um, um, Chomsky quoting the alleged promise that not one inch um, NATO would not advance in, uh, you know, by one inch. It was meant within Germany. And in fact, Jim Baker, Jim Baker had a big op-ed piece in the New York Times about a month ago on exactly this topic. And it's not just Chomsky, but many others uh, like Mearsheimer, one of the most, um, uh, you know, regarded prestigious, if you will, political scientists from the University of Chicago, he has a uh, clip on uh, YouTube um, that has been seen by more than 2 million people in which he basically says, the, expresses the line of Václav Klaus, it's all the West fall. Uh, the, it is the West that brought the crisis to a boil. It is the West with its provocative, consistent sort of steps, um, um, coming closer and closer to Russia that ultimately uh, triggered this uh, reaction on the part of uh, Mr. Putin. Um, I don't think that's uh, justified. It's, uh, it's a very interesting, I was a part of Czech underground, you remember, and Charter 77, I knew Václav Havel personally. Václav Havel was personally uh, uh, for the dissolution of Warsaw Pact and NATO, both of them. I remember it very well in that yes, he, but he changed against his NATO mind. also. <laughs> and then the advisors sort of pushed on him, on him, it would be very good to be accepted to NATO, you know. There was not a referendum in Czech Republic about being accepted to NATO, you know. So, I sorry, I, <laughs> I think it's one of the biggest mistakes of Western diplomacy. To I think it's the best alliance the world um, has seen in the from the twenty first to the twenty from from the twentieth to the twenty first century. Yeah. Yes. Well, anyway, you know, okay. I, I I liked your presentation. <laughs> well, I uh, I think we've hit most of the questions, and we've 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 dragged uh, Igor well into overtime uh, with the Q and A. Uh, so I would uh, like to thank all of our audience for, for showing up. Uh, and I would, of course, uh, encourage Luca, uh, Igor to, to check out uh, a lot of uh, just uh, thanks and uh, statements of appreciation in the chat uh, for, for your talk. Um, uh, thank you to the audience for, for coming. Again, I'd like to remind you to join us on uh, Sunday, April 10th uh, for our program on Maria Provaznikova. Uh, still going to be dealing with some Cold War issues. Uh, and thank you, Igor, so much for this talk, which I think really did help a lot of us to uh, make some more sense of, of, of these events. Thank you so much. Thank you.